welcome everyone. We're going to get started right on time. It is truly incredible to have so many of you from all across the country joining us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in applying for the Plants Grant. My name is Lee Howe and I'm the Plants Project Director for the Chef Ann Foundation. And today we're joined by Jennifer and Byron who will be providing live Spanish translation during the webinar. So before I go any further, Byron will explain in Spanish how to access the interpretation room. We'll also put those instructions in the chat now. Gracias. Uh, para accesar el español, a uh, parte inferior, um, mano izquierda, va a haber un globo. Así simplemente escoge ese globo y luego escoge su idioma, uh, sea en español, para los hispanohablantes. Gracias. Thank you so much, Byron. I'll give everyone uh, a second to get situated in the right room. All right, so as a reminder, PLANT stands for Partnerships for Local Agriculture and Nutrition Transformation in Schools. We are so excited to share more information about this funding opportunity and the application, which launched just two days ago on Monday the 27th. The purpose of today's webinar is to break down the plants application process and its components to make it more accessible and to highlight some key criteria to keep in mind as you work through it. Before we dive in, I'll share some accessibility options for the webinar. First, if closed captioning would aid your experience today, please find the closed caption button on your Zoom toolbar, click the up arrow, and on the menu that pops up, select show subtitle. Likewise, if questions arise during the webinar today, you can submit those by finding the Q&A button also on your Zoom toolbar. Once you click the button, you'll be prompted to type your question. Uh, we won't have time to respond to live questions during the webinar today, but we'll collect all questions and include responses to them in the Q&A section of our Plants Grant webpage. So here's a snapshot of our agenda for this webinar. We'll hear opening remarks from USDA's Food Nutrition, Nutrition Service Administrator, Cindy Long. Then we'll introduce the Chef Ann Foundation and the Plants Grant Project team. We'll give an overview of the plants funding opportunity, and then we'll dive into some of the details of the application, corresponding scoring criteria, and other important things to be mindful of as you pull together your proposal. And finally, we'll close out with tips for how to submit a successful application and respond to some of our most frequently asked questions so far. And just a quick note that we'll be sharing links to the RFA sections that we're referencing in the chat so you can follow along with more detail, um, and we'll share a link to the entire RFA in the chat now. Next slide. And now I wanna take a moment to say how grateful we are to the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service for funding the Healthy Meals Incentive Initiative. This partnership is a meaningful opportunity for Chef Ann Foundation to deepen our work with communities across the U.S. to ensure that all children have equal access to healthy and delicious school food so they can thrive and meet their full potential. With that, we're so honored to share opening remarks from Administrator Long via video today. It's wonderful to have her support as we kick off this funding opportunity together. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to join you today to help kick off the Plants Grant Launch webinar. FNS is absolutely thrilled to partner with the Chef Ann Foundation. I so admire and support the organization's mission, which is all about ensuring that school food professionals have the resources, the funding, and all the other support they need to provide fresh and healthy and delicious scratch cooked meals to support the health of our children. You know, I want to share with you that before becoming the administrator of the Food and Nutrition Service, I actually had um, the, the tremendous privilege of having a long career here at FNS, and I spent most of my time working on the child nutrition programs. They matter deeply to me um, for, uh, you know, for several reasons. You know, every single day, almost 30 million kids eat a school meal, so the reach of the programs is tremendous. We also know from recent research that schools are the healthiest place that a child can receive a meal. So in, that is why improving and supporting school nutrition programs is a top priority for FNS, 
for USDA and for the Biden-Harris administration. You know, the, let me share a little bit about why we uh, instituted the Healthy Meals Incentive Program. You know, as I said, the Biden-Harris administration is all in on supporting school nutrition. We know what an incredibly valuable program it is, and we know that it's not enough just to be looking at things like policies and regulations and meal standards. We need to have a commitment to supporting the school nutrition professionals who actually do this work. That's why we have invested $100 million in the Healthy Meals Incentive Initiative. That funding is meant to help support those school nutrition professionals who are doing the everyday work of transforming the school food system. Uh, so we are doing everything we can to support those efforts. Let me tell you just a little bit about all of the opportunities under HMI. So the first phase of the, of the project involved the establishment of a recognition award for school districts. And I know that's not what we're here to talk about today, but I hope you'll take a look at that and see if it's something you're interested in. We also had the opportunity this past summer to make a series of grants for small and rural school districts who often struggle to have the resources we needed, we, they need. We're also gonna be having over the course of the next year and a half or so, three healthy school meal summits to share some of the learning from the overall project. But let's talk a little bit about what we're focused on today, and that is the School Food Systems Transformation Challenge. We've partnered with several organizations, including the Chef Ann Foundation, uh, to provide so, so that those organizations can provide grants to support collaborative projects between school districts, food producers, suppliers, distributors, and community partners to stimulate the creation of a res resilient, equitable, and nutritious school food system. To put it simply, we want to make sure that school food nutrition professionals have access to the kind of food they need uh, to support what they're trying to do in their schools, and to do that in a um, resilient and sustainable way. I am really excited about the plant's focus on partnership development between schools and community food system stakeholders. Strengthening these relationships is so essential to building a resilient school food system that are rooted in shared values. We also know that the Chef Ann Foundation has extensive uh, experience with providing technical assistance for school nutrition operators in scratch cooking, and that will undoubtedly lead to um, exciting projects, which ultimately will lead to more nourishing, high quality, and healthy meals for students. So I wanna encourage everyone on today's webinar to, to listen, learn how the project and the, the grant process works, uh, put on your creative thinking caps and, and apply. We can't wait to see the innovative ideas and proposals that you and partners across industry, across your community uh, bring to the table. So I wanna close by thanking the Chef Ann Foundation uh, for their role in the Healthy Meals Incentives Project and for their partnership in everything uh, that they support in the school nutrition arena. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to join. Thank you again to Administrator Long for those remarks. We sincerely appreciate your support and partnership. And I'll take a moment now to provide a little background on the Chef Ann Foundation. We were founded in 2009 by Chef Ann Cooper and are dedicated to promoting whole ingredient scratch cooking in schools. We believe that scratch cooking enables schools to serve the healthiest, tastiest meals so that kids are well nourished and ready to learn. Our mission is to ensure that school food professionals have the resources, funding, and support that they need to provide those healthy, fresh, delicious scratch cooked meals that support the health of children on our planet. We work with K-12 schools in all 50 states and some U.S. territories, and to date, we've helped more than 14,000 schools and 3.4 million kids eat healthier school meals. We also believe that schools, especially those with scratch-cooked meal operations, play a critical role in building more resilient and equitable local school food systems. Schools have the potential to leverage their food purchasing to become a powerful market for small to mid-size and historically underserved food producers and businesses in their region. But as so many of you well know on this call, getting to that point is really hard work. Uh, schools face complex supply chain, operational, infrastructural, and financial challenges. And likewise, regional producers and food businesses often face a daunting number of hurdles in order to access the school food marketplace. And this is exactly where the Plants Grant and CAF's amazing project team partners come into play. 
We are so grateful to work with three other organizations to design and implement the plants grant. We've got Kitchen Sink Strategies Collaborative, the National Farm to School Network, and the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition. And I'm going to pass it off to each of them to introduce themselves and share an overview of their organization and role. So Elliot, take it away. Thanks, Lee. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Elliot Smith, co-founder and CEO of Kitchen Sink Strategies, and we're a small but mighty group that works to help people and institutions be in relationship with their food and farmers. And we're committed to building fairer, healthier regional food economies across the U.S. For plants, we are super excited to be joining forces with two close partner companies who also support small-scale food system stakeholders and institutions in our shared work of developing those more resilient regionalized food economies. And those folks are Supply Change LLC, led by H. Nieto Friga, who's not with us today, uh, and Shared Plate Strategies, led by Ben Thomas, who is with us today. So this Kitchen Sink Strategies Collaborative is focused on fostering linkages between the many actors that we all know are needed to make local food, farm to school, and values-based procurement, something that feels seamless and sustainable for school food authorities, for producers, and for intermediaries like food hubs and other actors. So throughout this grant, we're doing this work in, in operating three specific strategies, supporting suppliers to scale and meet the needs of school food authorities in their region through targeted value chain coordination, supporting school food authorities to increase their local food purchases and foster deeper partnerships with values aligned suppliers and providing technical assistance to the school food authorities, suppliers and supporters to grow regional farm to school movements across the country. So we are super thrilled to be supporting plants grantees and we'll talk more about how later, but we see this model and our partnership with Chef Ann as, as really the future of what this movement needs. So I'll pass it over to you, Leah, and you can introduce Gretchen Swanson. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Carpenter, Associate Director for the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition. GSCN is a nonprofit research institute founded in 1973 and headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. We work nationally to provide partnership and expertise in measurement and evaluation to help develop, enhance, and expand programs that are focused on the promotion of healthy eating and active living, food and nutrition security, and local food systems. With expertise in public health nutrition and mixed methods evaluation approaches, our team is dedicated to building measurement strategies to assess the impact of innovative health-related programs. And for plants, we will lead the design and implementation of the evaluation of each grant program as well as conduct an overarching evaluation of the initiative as a whole. And I'll pass it to David. Thanks, Leah. Hi, everyone. I am David Hudabart, the National Farm to School Network Partnership Director. I, along with my teammate, Sonny Baker, the Senior Director of Programs and Policy, are going to be supporting this uh, project. A little bit about NFSN. NFSN works across the country as an information, advocacy, and networking hub for communities working to bring local food sourcing and food and agriculture education into school systems and early care and education environments. Our mission is to increase access to local food and nutrition education to improve children's health, strengthen family farms, and cultivate vibrant communities. Um, we like to say farm to school is a triple win, supporting kids, farm and community. For plants, NFSN will support peer-to-peer -peer learning and skill building across grantees through a community of practice. Grantees will also be integrated into NFSN's ongoing network operations, providing access to NFSN peer networking and resources, opportunities to engage in other NFSN programming, webinars, and events. Before we dive into the details, of the plants grant, we wanted to share some of the values that are central to the plants program. First, we want to support projects that have a systems-based approach to food system transformation. We will give preference to projects that address root causes in order to have a long-lasting impact into the future. Second, we also want to support the development of strong local partnerships and networks. Relationships are an essential piece of value chain coordination 
And as such, we aim to fund partners that have a history of collaboration and or intention to strengthen networks to build a more resilient local food system. Third, we're also centering equity in all aspects of the plant's process and will preference projects that intentionally serve diverse populations, engage impacted community members, that include SSAs with CEP or that are tribally controlled, as well as projects that have an impact on historically underserved food producers and businesses. And fourth, last but not least, we also value transparency and wanna be transparent with you during each step of the application process, including in our review process and scoring criteria. Transparency is also a value that we hold when it comes to our food system. We believe that the public, including students, parents, and food service operators, uh, has a right to know where our food comes from, how it was produced, and can access supply chain data in order to help us all make more informed choices. Plants will fund proposals that align with the objectives you see here on the slide, building and strengthening relationships among community-based school food system stakeholders, such as school food professionals, local farmers, distributors, aggregators, parents, students, and other organizations and populations who are impacted by the school food supply chain improving school food supply chain coordination to support uh, the shared values and needs of local farmers and other food producers, as well as K-12 schools, expanding scratch cooking operations in K-12 schools to both provide more nourishing, high quality, and culturally inclusive meals to students, as well as incorporate more local and sustainably produced ingredients into those meals increasing awareness of and access to K-12 markets among small, mid-scale, and historically underserved food producers, aggregators, and processors. And lastly, establishing a sustainable approach and best practices for improvement of the K-12 food system that are easily scalable and adoptable by other organizations. Using a competitive process, we will award grants between $500,000 and $600,000 to eight local projects. This grant does not require grantees to match funding. The grant period will be three years and two months and kick off early next spring. And the funding opportunity is national in scope. Applicants must be based in the contiguous United States, Hawaii, Alaska, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, or the U.S. Virgin Islands. And here are some of the applicant eligibility requirements. Projects must be collab collaboratively administered by at least three local partners and have a designated lead partner. A maximum of five partners can be named on the application. Groups of partners must include at least one school food authority or SFA. An SFA is defined as the administering body for the operation of a school food feeding program, such as the National School Lunch Program and Be Breakfast Program. The SFA is the entity that receives federal meal reimbursements for meal programs and is responsible for ensuring that meal counts and eligibility criteria are met. This may be a school district, several school districts, or individual schools. Schools can be public, public charter, or private schools. SFAs also include residential child care facilities that participate in the National School Lunch or Breakfast Program. Other partners may include groups such as food producers, including farmers, ranchers, and fisher folk, processors, manufacturers, distributors, or other suppliers, cooperative extension, local government agencies, or nonprofit organizations working on the food system. The lead partner must have a demonstrated history of building a nutritious school food program or developing strong local food systems that serve K-12 schools. The lead partner will be responsible for coordinating all grant activities and reporting requirements. All partners must be located within 250 miles of the lead partner. Preference will be given to partnerships formed with historically underserved farm or food businesses, SFAs with CEP or that are operated under the Bureau of Indian Education, and those that demonstrate a history of collaboration and achieving the intended objectives. Be sure to thoroughly review section three of the RFA, which covers applicant eligibility. And Ben, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Leah. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Thomas, and I'm the founder of Shared Plate Strategies and part of the Kitchen Sink Strategies Collaborative on the Plants Grant. As Elliot touched on earlier, the Plants Grant project team will provide grantees with the training, tools, and resources necessary to, to achieve their project goals. All four organizations will provide in-depth, individualized technical assistance that will take place both in person and virtually throughout the grant period. Each project team will undergo an initial assessment to determine the types of training and TA necessary to achieve their, their objectives. Technical assistance from Chef Ann Foundation and Plants Project Partner Organizations will be provided at no cost to grantees. It's included. However, grantees are expected to budget the appropriate staff time for both in-person and virtual technical assistance and evaluation support activities. So putting all this information about the plants funding opportunity together, CAF and the Plants Grant Project Team will provide in-depth and individualized training and technical assistance to partnerships that are actively collaborating to build resilient and equitable local food supply chains in order to increase the availability of and access to nutritious and scratch cooked food in K-12 schools. And I'll pass it back to Lee. Thanks everyone. Okay, so now we are gonna dive into the plants application process. So during this section, we're gonna break down how to get set up and navigate the plants grant portal, partner involvement and responsibilities, some of the required sections of the application, including how each section will be scored and tips for writing a strong application. So to start your application, you're gonna to need to access the plants online grant portal that houses all components of the grant application. The grant portal can be accessed at plantsgrant.org. Uh, you can also get there now via the QR code on the slide. Uh, and the lead partner will create an account and be responsible for completing the application within the portal. So when they open the portal, they'll see a button that says new user. The lead partner will click this uh, to create an account and start the application process. And once the lead partner has entered the contact information for each additional partner on their application, those partners will then receive email notification that they can also create an account and view the application in progress. So that said, only the lead partner will have editing access and upload access in the portal, but all project partners should still work together with the lead partner to craft the application. So after the lead partner has created an account, they can start an application by clicking learn more. The application can be accessed at any time by re-entering the portal and clicking continue application. The lead partner will be able to access and edit their application at any point before the application period ends at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 22nd, 2024. Once the application is submitted, they will no longer be able to make edits. Um, and all partners can view the submitted application by clicking view application. So the first section of the application consists of some key plants eligibility requirements. These questions echo the applicant eligibility requirements that we discussed earlier and are also detailed in section three of the RFA, as Leah mentioned. Um, so if you are an eligible applicant, your partnership will be able to answer yes to all of these questions, and then you'll then be allowed to proceed with the rest of the application. If you answer no to any single eligibility question, you will not be able to move forward. <clears throat> Okay, so after confirming that your partnership is eligible, you're gonna move on to the partner information section of the application, which will look like the screenshot on the slide. Again, the lead partner will fill all of this out, but we'll need to gather some of this information from uh, the other partners on the application. So this se section looks for basic organizational information, such as each partner's address, contact information, and tax ID. Um, as part of this, each partner, each of the partner's entity types must be selected, you know, for example, if you're a school food authority versus producer or nonprofit. Um, and then once that entity type is selected, that will generate a list of organizational questions that are specific to that entity type. So, for example, if you're a school food authority, um, there will be questions asking about the food service director's contact information, district enrollment number of schools and kitchens in the district. Um, and, and that won't be relevant to 
other entity types. So after filling out the organization information for each partner, you'll move on to the narrative sections of the application. You can find detailed instructions for this portion of the application in section four of the Plants Grant RFA called Application Instructions. Appendix B of the RFA also provides an outline of each of the narrative sections that um, and, and how they correspond to the Plants Grant scoring criteria. So please be sure to reference both the application instructions and scoring criteria while pulling together your application. And I'll mention that the total points um, possible for an, an entire application is 120 points. So moving forward, as we provide an overview of each of the application sections, um, we'll highlight the total point value assigned to each. Um, and I'll also highlight the character maximums for each section. So the first narrative section is your application summary. You wanna to aim to make this section concise while capturing the viewer's attention. This section should include your project title, a description of why your project is needed, the community you'll be serving, and the purpose and goals of your project. The character maximum for this section is 1500 characters and the total point value is five points. So, you know, a reviewer should be able to quickly glean what your project is about after reading this section. And even though it's the first narrative section, we actually recommend that you do this uh, last uh, before turning in your application. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, this section is really a high level sort of summary of the other parts of your application. Okay, so project partners is the next narrative section. Uh, here, you'll include a description of each partner, including the role that they'll play in your, in your project. Um, so if, in the lead partner description, you'll need to include information about the designated project coordinator. So if this is a current employee, you'll want to include their contact details and attach a resume uh, in the attachments section of your application. However, if you need to hire for this role, you should include a hiring plan and job description for this role. Um, the lead partner should also outline a contingency plan in the event that the project coordinator leaves the project. Um, and I'll note here that the plant scoring criteria reflects preference for school food authority partners that implement CEP or are operated under the Bureau of Indian Education, as well as partners that represent historically underserved farm or food businesses. And um, that definition is defined in Appendix A, definitions um, of the Plants Grant uh, RFA. So as a reminder, uh, you must have three partners to be eligible and can have up to five partners total. So after providing some background on each individual partner, you'll cover the history of the partnership and collaboration, achievements between those in the partnership. And if, if partners have not worked together previously, you should detail why you believe this partnership will be effective and uh, sustainable beyond the grant implementation period. Um, you'll also include key uh, information about collaborators that will be participating in the project. These, uh, and collaborators are organizations that are not named partners on the project. So, so they're not written into the project budget, but these are organizations, individuals that will play a big role in the project's success. Including information about key collaborators is totally optional. Um, and the character maximum for this section is 2,000 characters, regardless of the number of partners that you have on your project. Um, and the total point value for this section, as you can see, is 25 points. All right, so the project narrative is the next and most substantial section and has a character max of 3,500 characters and a total point value of 35 points. So applicants should really use this section to give plants grant reviewers a clear idea of the project's intended impact and how that impact will be achieved. This is also an opportunity to highlight how your school food authority partner or partners specifically will be involved in and impacted by the project. 
This section is also the place to share how your project aligns with plants grant objectives. So you should aim to answer questions like, how will you strengthen relationships between school food authorities and school food and sorry, local food producers and businesses? Um, how will your project work to increase sourcing of local products and scratch cooking? How will your project impact small to midsize um, and historically underserved food producers and businesses? And then the next two pieces of this application sort of further address two of the plants grant objectives related to equity and sustainability. So applicants should demonstrate how their project will advance equity in the food system. So this includes showing how a project is really centering members of the community with lived experience expertise. So that's could be students, food service staff, regional producers, and so on. Um, applicants could also demonstrate the impact of the project on school food authorities with CEP and or um, on historically underserved food producers and businesses. <clears throat> and finally, applicants should describe how their project will be sustained into the future. So in other words, tell us your plan for ensuring that this work will be continued beyond the three-year grant implementation period. The final narrative section is the budget narrative. This section, notably, does not have a character limit. Um, we did that because we encourage you to be as detailed as possible here. The budget narrative corresponds, of course, to the project budget and should justify the budget's direct costs. So, um, you know, in addition, applicants should also describe their plan for expenditure tracking and reporting in this section. And this is worth 10 points total. Your application will also include a number of attachments, all of which we have provided downloadable templates for. So you can download the templates directly from the plants portal, which you see a screenshot of on this slide, or from the plants grant webpage. Um, we've linked to templates in the chat uh, now for your reference, and each templated attachment should be filled out with your project's information and then saved as a PDF and titled according to the instructions on the top of the template. I've tried to make this as easy as possible. So the only exception here is that the budget template, which should uh, should be saved and uploaded as an Excel doc. That that instruction is also in the portal, but. Um, it is the only um, attachment that will not be a PDF. So um, the first attachment is your project plan, which details key activities, indicators, and responsible persons throughout the grant period. So major activities involved in the project plan and estimated dates of completion for each activity should be listed. You should aim to align with, again, as many as possible of the plants grant key objectives that Leah outlined earlier in the webinar. And Appendix C provides guidance for developing your project plan. The project plan is worth 20 total points. So the second attachment is your budget template. Applicants are required to create a project budget that includes expenses by category. You'll see them listed on this slide here. Those categories include personnel, fringe benefits, travel, equipment, supplies, contractual, and other. And applicants can request advance payments for up to 20% of their total budget. So requests for advance payments must be accompanied by a written justification in the budget narrative and must be included in the applicant's budget submission. So there's a, a template provided for advanced payment requests if you scroll down sort of towards the bottom of the budget template. And Appendix D, budget guidance in the RFA, has more information on like the level of detail required to fill, fulfill this section of the application. And um, just another reminder that applicants should upload the completed attachment, the, the budget template as an Excel doc, not a PDF in the application portal. Um, and the total point value for the budget template is 15 points. Okay, and now I just wanna take a, a quick moment to highlight a few eligible and ineligible expense requirements that, that might be like less obvious or unique to plants. So 
First, we want to highlight that grantees are required to budget the appropriate staff time for both in-person and virtual TA and evaluation support activities. So this is outlined in Section 8, Technical Assistance, which we linked to earlier in our presentation. We've estimated that each project partner should allot about 140 hours per year devoted to site visits, TA, and evaluation support. So project partners should determine the key personnel from each organization to participate in those TA-related activities. Food purchases are not allowed, but should be limited to meal program development or, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said not allowed, but food purchases are allowed, but should be limited to meal program development or educational purposes. So no more than 10% of grant funds may be used for food purchases. Um, travel, so including air, ground transportation, lodging, parking fees, meals, is an eligible expense. And we just want to note that you should be sure to include costs for attending one USDA Healthy Meals Summit that Administrator Long and, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and that summit will take place in 2025. Um, so this is in section six of the RFA. You can you can uh, find more details there about this particular required activity. Lastly, grantees may direct uh, may charge indirect costs, in including a negotiated uh, indirect cost rate agreement, also known as a NICRA, or the federally approved ten percent de minimis rate. Okay. <clears throat> On this slide, you'll see some examples of ineligible expenses for plants. Capital improvements are not an eligible expense. So this means that any major improvement to facilities and or infrastructure that would add to the permanent value of a building are not eligible. So for example, costs associated with the labor and supplies to pour cement to accommodate a new ramp for a loading dock would not be allowable, but the cost of the ramp itself would be allowable as an equipment cost. Vehicles uh, cannot be purchased with grant funding. However, vehicles may be leased. And if you're gonna lease a vehicle, that would be categorized under contractual. Plants also cannot fund lobbying or advocacy efforts. So for example, funding can not support events where elected officials will be present or any costs associated with influencing the enactment of legislation, regulation, administrative action, or executive order that has been proposed um, that has been been proposed before any legislative body. And lastly here, just remember that grantees should not include costs associated with TA or training offered by the plants grant team. The TA itself will be provided at no cost to grantees. Um, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, grantees just need to budget the personnel time and resources necessary just to participate in those TA activities. Okay, some other required attachments include either a signed MOU from all project partners or a letter of commitment from each project partner. Resumes of key staff involved in project implement implementation should be included, or if a key position has not been filled, a job description no more than one page in length can be included in lieu of a resume. Um, and please note that there should be no more and no less than three resumes and or job descriptions submitted. There are 10 points total for submitting the attachments that you see on this slide. And I am thrilled to pass it to Ben for some final notes on plants scoring criteria. Thank you, Lee. So one final thing to note on the scoring criteria, the total point value for each narrative section is further broken down in the subsection scoring criteria so that applicants have visibility into how each piece of a particular section is scored. For example, the application summary section is worth five points total, with two points allotted for the statement of need, two points for the description of the community served, and one point for the project purpose and goals. Please reference the actual scoring criteria to make sure your application is comprehensive 
and that you are addressing all scoring criteria for the best possible score. Our plans grant reviewers will be scoring applications based off of the point allocations laid out in the scoring criteria. The application is currently open and will close on January 22nd, 2024 at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. No applications will be accepted past this date. We recommend that you submit your application three business days prior to the deadline. This will allow time for troubleshooting if needed. The applicant is responsible for ensuring that CAF receives the submission before the deadline. The Plants Grant project team will begin review on January 23rd and will announce awards in March 2024. Grant period of performance is April 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2027. So that's the project, the maximum project period for the grant. And David, do you want to take it away? Thank you. So we wanted to share um, some tips for submitting a strong application. When you begin the application, you will also see a list of tips um, to help you write a strong application. So first, um, we're just gonna wanna get a plant's portal technology tip out of the way. Um, our grant portal will log users out if the page is left open and idle for 24 hours. And in this case, any unsaved work will be lost. So please get in the habit of saving your work frequently along the way. As we all know, technology has their different quirks, and this is one of the quirks that we have with the technology that we are using. Um, number two, as we've mentioned, we recommend that you familiarize yourself with the plan scratch RFA before beginning to write your application. It is a lengthy document, we know, but it can answer many questions you may have during the process. If you have a question that is not answered by the RFA, you can check the FAQ on the plan scratch website, and if your question is not answered there, please email us at plants at chefandfoundation.org and we will respond to your question and add it to the FAQ. So others who may have the same questions can also view it there. Number three, when writing your application, we recommend that you keep your responses concise and clear. So try to cut any superfluous information or redundancies. And when considering what information is necessary, please keep the audience, your audience, the plants grant reviewers in mind. So for example, plants grant reviewers are knowledgeable about USDA child nutrition programs and school food operations, but may not be familiar with your partnership community or geographic region. Number four, aim to use plain, easily understood language when writing your application. There are no points set aside for fancy wordplay. Um, on a similar note, please limit the use of abbreviations and acronyms, or if you use any, define them at their first use. Um, again, consider who your audience is and what knowledge we may or may not have. Um, number five, before submitting your application, review your work and ensure all sections are answered completely. It's best practice to have multiple people, especially your part project partners, review your application for spelling, grammar, and clarity before submitting. And finally, be sure to double check that all required attachments are correctly uploaded to your application. And with that, I will pass it back to Lee. Thanks, David. Okay, so now we're gonna take a moment to answer some of the questions that we've received during and after um, our sneak peek webinar in October. So if your questions are not answered in today's webinar, as David mentioned, please first review the FAQ on our website, which we'll be updating weekly with new questions that come in, uh, including the questions that we receive in the chat today. Um, so if you have questions after this webinar that didn't make it into the chat, you can, of course, email them to plants at chefannfoundation.org, and we'll, we'll flash that email again a little bit later. Um, so our first question is, can organizations apply to multiple USDA Healthy Meal Incentives, which we'll refer to as HMI, initiative, school food system transformation challenge subgrants. That's a mouthful. But as a reminder, these are just the, the HMI part two subgrants. Um, 
So the answer to this question is that organizations can indeed apply and be awarded for multiple HMI2 subgrants. However, organizations may only be the lead applicant on one HMI subgrant opportunity, but can be supporting partners or sort of sub applicants on um, multiple. Leah, you want to take the next question? <laughs> Yes, our next question is, what is the difference between a plant's partner and collaborator? Plants partners hold more responsibility and are more deeply involved in the project implementation. Lead partners will provide a memorandum of understanding representing all partners or collect letters of commitment from each partner, but nothing is required of collaborators. Partners are written into the project budget and must participate in reporting and evaluation, and collaborators are not subject to these requirements, but have the option of contributing a letter of support for the project. As we've discussed, each partnership should include an SFA partner, and we've received this question, are SFAs that have not adopted CEP eligible? Yes. Any SFA can apply regardless of their free or reduced percentage or adoption of CEP. The plants grant scoring criteria, preferences schools that have adopted CEP, but it is not an eligibility requirement. So Ben, I'll pass it to you for the next question. We've received some questions about whether other institutional non-school district food serve or, or school food service programs are eligible for the plants grant. Uh, the plans grant was created to strengthen partnerships between SFAs and local food system stakeholders. However, as long as at least one of the partners is a school food authority, other local government agent agencies or institutions like healthcare facilities, uh, senior care communities, adult correctional facilities, post-secondary education are eligible to be a plants partner. On a similar note, Another question is whether organizations that run after school feeding programs are eligible for the plants grant. School food authority partners must participate in the national school lunch program. Participation in after school feeding programs does not make an el organization eligible to apply as an SFA. However, a nonprofit organization that runs an after school feeding program, such as a food bank, would be eligible to apply as a food support organization in a partnership that has at least one school food authority partner. And uh, next question is from Elliot. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, Lee outlined the importance earlier about the different partner types and we've all touched on this at some point. Um, we had heard this really kind of important question. What's the real difference between the lead partner and other partner types on the application. So we want to come back to that and reiterate what we said about partner types in the application for everyone's sake. Just to be clear, any partner type can be the lead of the application. As Leah mentioned earlier, as long as that lead partner has a demonstrated history of building nutritious school food program or developing strong local food systems that serve K-12 schools, good to go. So if you're a producer that has that demonstrated history, you can be the lead partner. If you're a, let's say, food hub or processor with that history, you can be the lead partner. And if you're an SFA with that history, surprise, you too can be the lead partner. As long as the application as a whole has each of the required partner types represented and each application has a school food authority on it, any of your partners can play the lead role. We have also received some important questions about our distance requirements for partnerships. And the RFA, as we've said, stipulates that all partners must be located within 250 miles of the lead partner. As a team, we decided to set this requirement in an attempt to ensure that the partnerships are geographically bound. It's kind of like our attempt to define local for the grant. But we're all very well aware that there is definitely not one size that fits all for the definition of local. So. Checking, looking at you, Alaska, Texas, Montana, you big folks. Um, so there's an exemption to this requirement. Uh, and no matter where you are in any state, if your partnership includes an organization beyond that maximum allowable miles, 250 mile radius, but you believe that that distance is justifiable because of the geography associated in your system, 
please describe that in detail in the project partners section of your application and help us understand why you believe the project should be considered beyond that 250 mile radius. The proposal reviewers uh, will take that into account and accept the justification at their discretion um, when they're doing the rest of the review of the application. And our final question, does PLANTS grant cover capital improvements? As we discussed during the eligible expenses portion of the webinar, capital improvements or any major improvement to facilities and infrastructure that would add to the permanent value of the building are not allowable expenses. A great way to discern if something is a capital improvement is to ask if the building were to be turned upside down, would this piece of equipment be held in, in place? For example, if a piece of equipment is affixed to the building due to its connection to the building's plumbing, this would not be an eligible expense. If a piece of equipment requires you to make a permanent change to the building, then the equipment may be allowable, but the construction costs would not be. For example, costs associated with the labor and supplies to pour cement uh, to accommodate a new ramp for a loading dock would not be allowable, but the cost of the ramp would be an allowable equipment cost. For more information, see Section 3, Award Details of the Plants Grant RFA. And Lee, back to you. All right, everyone, that is all for our Plants Grant launch webinar today. We really hope you found this useful and wish you all the best of luck as you work through the application. Um, as I mentioned already, we've recorded all questions received in the chat during the webinar. We'll be providing responses to those questions in the FAQ section of our Plants Grant webpage, uh, which as you see on the slide is www.plantsgrant.org. You can also submit your questions to us directly via the Plants Grant email address, which you can also see on the slide, plants at chefannfoundation.org. Um, all right. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy weeks. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your day and look forward to receiving your application soon. Take care, everyone.